Sir Thomas Brown was an English polymath and author of varied works which reveal his wide learning in diverse fields including science and medicine, religion and the esoteric. Brown's writings display a deep curiosity towards the natural world, influenced by the scientific revolution of Baconian inquiry. Brown's literary works are permeated by references to classical and biblical sources as well as the idiosyncrasies of his own personality. Although often described as suffering from melancholia, his writings are also characterized by wit and subtle humor. While his literary style is varied, according to genre, resulting in a rich, unique prose which ranges from rough notebook observations to polished Baroque eloquence. Biography Early life The son of a silk merchant from Upton, Cheshire, he was born in the parish of St. Michael, Cheapside, in London on 19 October 1605. His father died while he was still young and he was sent to school at Winchester College. In 1623 Brown went to Oxford University. He graduated from Pembroke College, Oxford in 1626, after which he studied medicine at Padua and Montpellier universities, completing his studies at Leiden, where he received a medical degree in 1633. He settled in Norwich in 1637 and practiced medicine there until his death in 1682. Literary Works Brown's first literary work was Religia Medici. This work was circulated as a manuscript among his friends. It surprised him when an unauthorized edition appeared in 1642, since the work included several unorthodox religious speculations. An authorized text appeared in 1643, with some of the more controversial views removed. The expurgation did not end the controversy. In 1645, Alexander Ross attacked Religia Medici in his Medicus Medicatus and, in common with much Protestant literature, the book was placed upon the Papal Index Librorum Prohibitorum in the same year. In 1646, Brown published his Encyclopedia, Pseudodoxiae Epidemica, or, Enquiries into Very Many Received Tenets, and Commonly Presumed Truths whose title refers to the prevalence of false beliefs and vulgar errors, a skeptical work that debunks a number of legends circulating at the time in a methodical and witty manner. It displays the Baconian side of Brown, the side that was unafraid of what at the time was still called the new learning. The book is significant in the history of science because it promoted an awareness of up-to-date scientific journalism. Brown's last publication during his lifetime were two philosophical discourses which are closely related to each other in concept. The first, Hydriotaphia, and Burial, or a brief discourse of the sepulchral urns lately found in Norfolk inspired by the discovery of some Bronze Age burials in earthenware vessels, found in Norfolk, resulted in a literary meditation upon death, the funerary customs of the world and the ephemerality of fame. The other discourse in the diptych is antithetical in style, subject matter and imagery. The Garden of Cyrus, or the Quincuncial Lozenge, or network plantations of the ancients, artificially, naturally, and mystically considered features the quincunx which is used by Brown to demonstrate evidence of the platonic forms in art and nature. Later life and knighthood in Religia Medici, Brown confirmed his belief. In accordance with the vast majority of 17th-century European society, in the existence of angels and witchcraft, he attended the 1662 Bury St. Edmund's Witch Trial, where his citation of a similar trial in Denmark may have influenced the jury's minds of the guilt of two accused women, who were subsequently executed for the crime of witchcraft. In 1671 King Charles II, accompanied by the court, visited Norwich. The courtier John Evelyn, who had occasionally corresponded with Brown, took good use of the royal visit to call upon the learned doctor of European fame and wrote of his visit. His whole house and garden is a paradise and cabinet of rarities and that of the best collection amongst medales, books, plants, natural things. During his visit, Charles visited Brown's home. 
a banquet was held in the Civic Hall Street. Andrews for the royal visit, obliged to honour a notable local. The name of the mayor of Norwich was proposed to the king for knighthood. The mayor, however, declined the honour and proposed Brown's name instead. Death and aftermath Sir Thomas Brown died on his 77th birthday, 19 October 1682. His library was held in the care of his eldest son Edward until 1708. The auction of Brown and his son Edward's libraries in January 1711 was attended by Hans Sloane. Additions from Sir Thomas Brown's library subsequently became included in the founding collection of the British Library. His missing skull became the subject of dispute when in 1840 his lead coffin was accidentally reopened by workmen. It was not reinterred until 4 July 1922 when it was registered in the Church of St. Peter Mancroft as aged 317 years. Brown's coffin plate, stolen the same time as his skull, was also eventually recovered, broken into two halves, one of which is on display at St. Peter Mancroft, alluding to the commonplace opus of alchemy it reads, Amplis imus ver, dot hoc locolo in dormiens, corporus spagiris i pulvera plumbum in aurum convert it, loosely translated from Latin as, great virtues, sleeping here the dust of his spagiric body converts the lead to gold. The origin of the invented word spagirisi are from the Greek of spao to tear open, plus agiro to collect, a signature neologism coined by Paracelsus to define his medicine-oriented alchemy, the origins of iatrochemistry, being first advanced by him. Brown's coffin plate verse, along with the collected works of Paracelsus and several followers of the Swiss physician listed in his library are evidence that although often highly critical of Paracelsus, he nevertheless, like the Luther of medicine, believed in palingenesis, physiognomy, alchemy, astrology and the Kabbalah. Autobiography On 14 March 1673, Brown sent a short autobiography to the antiquarian John Aubrey, presumably for Aubrey's collection of brief lives which provides an introduction to his life and writings. I was born in St. Michael's Cheap in London, went to school at Winchester College, then went to Oxford, spent some years in foreign parts, was admitted to be a socius honorarius of the College of Physicians in London, night is September 1671, when the King Charles II, the Queen and Court came to Norwich. Rich Religia Medici in English, which was since translated into Latin, French, Italian, High and Low Dutch, Pseudodoxia Epidemica, or inquiries into common and vulgar errors translated into Dutch four or five years ago, Hydritafia, or an burial, Hortus Syra, or de Quincunz, have some miscellaneous tracts which may be published, literary works, Religia Medici. Pseudodoxia Epidemica, Book 2 includes Brown's experiments with static electricity and magnetism and introduces the term electricity, hydritafia, and burial, the Garden of Cyrus, a letter to a friend, Christian morals, Museum Clausum Tract 13 from Miscellaneous Tracts First Pub, 1684, see also Library of Sir Thomas Brown, Literary Influence. Brown is widely considered one of the most original writers in the English language. The freshness and ingenuity of his mind invested everything he touched with interest, while on more important subjects his style, if frequently ornate and latinate, often rises to the highest pitch of stately eloquence. His paradoxical place in the history of ideas, as equally a devout Christian, a promoter of the new inductive science and adherent of ancient esoteric learning, have greatly contributed to his ambiguity in the history of ideas. For these reasons, the literary critic Robert Sancourt succinctly assessed him as an instance of scientific reason lit up by mysticism in the Church of England.
However, the complexity of Brown's labyrinthine thought processes, his highly stylized language, along with his many allusions to biblical, classical and contemporary learning, along with esoteric authors, are each contributing factors for why he remains obscure, little read and thus, misunderstood. Brown appears at no. 69 in the Oxford English Dictionary, S list of top cited sources. He has 775 entries in the OED of first usage of a word, is quoted in a total of 4,131 entries of first evidence of a word, and is quoted 1596 times as first evidence of a particular meaning of a word. Examples of his coinages, many of which are of a scientific or medical nature, include ambidextrous, antediluvian, analogous, approximate, ascetic, anomalous, carnivorous, coexistence, coma, compensate, computer, cryptography, cylindrical, disruption, ergotisms, electricity, exhaustion, ferocious, follicle, generator, gymnastic, hallucination, herbaceous, holocaust, insecurity, indigenous, jocularity, literary, locomotion, medical, migrant, mucus, prairie, prostate, polarity, precocious, pubescent, therapeutic, suicide, ulterior, ultimate, and veterinarian. The influence of his literary style spans four centuries. In the 18th century, Samuel Johnson, who shared Brown's love of the Latinate, wrote a brief life in which he praised Brown as a faithful Christian and assessed his prose thus. His style is, indeed, a tissue of many languages, a mixture of heterogeneous words brought together from distant regions, with terms originally appropriated to one at, and drawn by violence into the service of another. He must, however, be confessed to have augmented our philosophical diction, and, in defense of his uncommon words and expressions, we must consider that he had uncommon sentiments, and was not content to express, in many words, that idea for which any language could supply a single term. In the 19th century Brown's reputation was revived by the Romantics. Thomas de Quincey, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, and Charles Lamb were all admirers. Carlyle was also influenced by him. The American novelist Herman Melville, heavily influenced by his style, deemed him a cracked archangel. The epigraph of Edgar Allan Poe's The Murders in the Rue Morgue is from Brown's Hydriotaphia. What song the Sirens sang, or what name Achilles assumed when he hid himself among women, although puzzling questions, are not beyond all conjecture. The novelist Joseph Conrad prefaced his 1913 novel Chance with a quotation by Brown. The English author Virginia Woolf wrote two short essays about him, observing in 1923, few people love the writings of Sir Thomas Brown, but those that do are the salt of the earth. In the 20th century those who have admired the English man of letters include the American natural historian and paleontologist Stephen Jay Gould, the theosophist Madame Blavatsky, the Scottish psychologist R. D. Lane, who opens his work The Politics of Experience with a quotation by him, Thus is man that great and true amphibian whose nature is disposed to live not only like other creatures in diverse elements, but in divided and distinguished worlds. The composer William Alwyn wrote a symphony in 1973 based upon the rhythmical cadences of Brown's literary work Hydriotaphia and Burial. The American author Armistead Maupin includes a quote from Religia Medici in the preface to the third in his Tales of the City novels. Further Tales of the City, first published in 1982, the Canadian physician William Osler, the founding father of modern medicine, was a well-read admirer of Brown. The German author W.G. Sebald wrote of Brown in his semi-autobiographical novel The Rings of Saturn. The Argentinian writer George Louis Borges alluded to Brown throughout his literary writings, from his first publication, Fervor de Buenos Aires until his last years. He described Brown as the best prose writer in the English language. Such was his admiration of Brown as a literary stylist and thinker that late in his life he stated of himself, 
alluding to his self-portrait in Ton, Eukbar, Orbis, Tertius, I am merely a word for Chesterton, for Kafka, and Sir Thomas Brown, I love him. I translated him into 17th century Spanish and it worked very well. We took a chapter out of Urn Burial and we did that into Quiverdo Spanish and it went very well. In his short story, The Celestial Omnibus, published in 1911, M. Forster makes Brown the first driver that the young protagonist encounters on the magical omnibus line that transports its passengers to a place of direct experience of the aesthetic sublime reserved for those who internalize the experience of poetry, as opposed to those who merely acquire familiarity with literary works for snobbish prestige. The story is an allegory about true appreciation of poetry and literature versus pedantry. In North Towards Home, Willie Morris quotes Sir Thomas Brown's urn burial from memory as he walks up Park Avenue with William Styron, and since death must be the Lucina of life, and even pagans could doubt whether thus to live were to die, since our longest sun sets at right dissensions, and makes but wind twin arches and therefore it cannot be long before we lie down in darkness and have our light in ashes. At that instant I was almost clipped by a taxi cab, and the driver stuck his head out and yelled, Ain't you got eyes in that head, ya yeah, bum? William Styron prefaced his 1951 novel Lie Down in Darkness with the same quotation as noted above in the remarks about Willie Morris's memoir. The title of Styron's novel itself comes from that quotation. Spanish writer Javier Marías translated two works of Brown, Religia Medici and Hydriotaphia, Portraits and Influence in the Visual Arts. In 1932 the English painter Paul Nash was invited to illustrate a book of his own choice. Nash chose Sir Thomas Brown's Urn Burial and the Garden of Cyrus, providing the publisher with a set of 32 illustrations to accompany Brown's discourses. A pencil drawing by Nash called Urn Burial, Teeth, Bones and Hair is held by Birmingham Museums Trust. The National Portrait Gallery in London has a fine contemporary portrait by Joan Carlyle of Sir Thomas Brown and his wife Dorothy, Lady Brown. More recent sculptural portraits include Henry Alfred Pegram's statue of Sir Thomas contemplating with Urn in Norwich. This statue occupies the central position in the Haymarket beside Street, Peter Mancroft, not far from the site of his house. It was erected in 1905 and moved from its original position in 1973. In 2005 Robert Milam's small standing figure in silver and bronze was commissioned for the 400th anniversary of Brown's birth.